morning. Um, I'm, my name is Rachel Sheikh, and um, I'm happy to introduce today's panel, um, Women and Experts in AI. Um, this is Catherine from Uber, and Emily from Google, who spoke yesterday. Um, Esperanza from KX, who also spoke yesterday, Catherine will speak today, and Sarah from Microsoft. Um, so what I'll do now is I'll just give each of them a chance to introduce themselves. Thanks so much. Um, I'm Catherine. I work at Uber uh, on Uber Eats specifically, so our food delivery arm, and I work on making time predictions in order to help our marketplace run more smoothly. Uh, if that sounds interesting, I'll be giving a talk later this afternoon. I studied computer science for my undergrad and statistics for my master's. Hi, I'm Emily Mittler from Google. I'm here in the New York office. I am a research scientist and I focus on natural language research. Um, my team works on both sort of low level utilities for natural language, like uh, language identification and parse speech checking and parsing, as well as topics in um, transfer learning and uh, question answering and uh, Hi, uh, my name is Esperanza, and I work at KX. I'm uh, work, uh, based in London, uh, and I'm working the machine learning team. Uh, basically, we don't have a clear uh, field. Like we can just build uh, machine learning solutions for any project that we can have uh, any topic. Uh, we work with manufacturing. Um, with cars, with uh, IOTs, uh, with space. Uh, so I basically uh, build machine learning solutions for the problem that we have. Okay, and I'm uh, Sarah Bird and I work at Microsoft. Uh, I lead research strategy for Azure AI, which means I'm looking at uh, sort of great new technologies and research and figuring out how do we take them to the next level and make them usable uh, for customers. And um, I also lead our responsible AI projects, so a lot of uh, work in AI ethics. Uh, so my name is Rishma Sheikh, and I'm an organizer for Women in Machine Learning and Data Science, which is a meetup group, and we have 71 chapters um, worldwide in 31 different countries, and we have 35,000 members worldwide. I'm also an organizer for Pi Ladies. Um, if anybody um, has any questions about when we'll DS or Pi Ladies, I'm happy to um, you know, speak to you um, after the event. Um, we are on Twitter, social media, everywhere under WIMLDS, um, so it's easy to find us. Um, my background is um, I'm a statistician in an MBA, and um, I'm, I work independently as a statistician, and I'm a board member for Wimble DS, so I do a lot of support for all the global chapters. So today's discussion, um, there's a report that was released last month called State of AI. It's about 164 slides. It was released by two venture capitalists in the UK. And um, the reason I thought about um, you know, discussing some of the items in this report is because um, most, if not all, of the reviewers of the report were all men. So I thought that you know, it would be interesting to see um, you know, what, um, what the report might look like or what the discussion would be from people who are not in that um, group of reviewers. Um, and so um, the first question, and I, and I know that, you know, you're sort of in this position where you haven't read the report, um, the State of AI, uh, but if you want to Google it, State of AI 20, um, 2019, yeah, you'll be able to find it. Um, so my first question is, and this is um, for Catherine, um, what information do you see is missing from the AI report? Thanks. So first of all, for those of you, I would count myself as one of these people as of like three days ago who haven't read it. What do they cover in the report? Um, so there's a lot of focus on trends in research, and some specific fields they highlight are advances in reinforcement learning, as well as natural language processing, and more broadly, applications to medicine. They not only cover research topics, but they also focus on industry trends. Um, one part of this is diversity in AI, looking at some statistics around representation in terms of publishing papers, but also just more broadly how in industry are these advances getting applied. They also make some fun predictions and then they score themselves 
with data on their last year's predictions to keep themselves accountable, which I thought was cool. Um, so it was an interesting report. I like the variety of perspectives. Another thing they had was public policy um, and machine learning and advances there, as well as advances in education and improving literacy around AI. So those were all topics that were covered. I would say in terms of what was missing, overall it was quite comprehensive, some specific research topics that I think are interesting, recent, and maybe didn't get as much coverage were fairness, interpretability, um, and transfer and meta-learning. And um, these are things that they talked about in a prior report too, so it's possible they didn't get as much attention for that reason. And then a final thing is like, I love how deep they went on applications in medicine specifically, but I think there are a lot of other interesting real world problems where AI can have a lot of impact that weren't as covered. So one of these would be climate change. There's an interesting workshop at ICML and paper around climate change. So I think that would have been something interesting to see some more coverage on. But overall, I, I thought it was well worth, well worth reading and gave a nice overview of uh, AI from a variety of perspectives. Does anybody else want to comment on the state of AI report? Okay. So I'll just, um, I had made some notes because I was going to tweet, um, tweet them and tell them, so I'll just share them here. Um, something that I would have liked to have seen is sort of the direction of data science, ML, AI, um, education. Um, we know that the number of programs in the world are really increasing, you know, with this field, so I would like to see stats on there. Um, I think one of the other um, discussions is location of these AI conferences are in a few select areas which make it difficult for people in other countries to get visas and travel, so it would have been interesting to see that. Um, would have been interesting to see the laws, like what the legal um, what the legal predicaments are, you know, keeping up with AI, not just in the US, but worldwide. And also sort of the cultural impact, you know, the number of podcasts, the movies, um, it would have been interesting to see the um, AI impact on that, so. Okay, so my next question is, what are your predictions for AI in 2020? Um, well, for what I've seen so far, as I said, I basically build machine learning solutions. And lately, um, I've seen that people are trying to make everything as simple as possible, so they just want uh, for us to give them the solution. So they are like, okay, give, I just want the solution, I just want this, and I want that um, in an easy way. So I think that we are moving to a world where people are interested in auto ML. Like, um, they don't want to know everything, they just want um, the output. They just want to have some data and say, okay, I'll give my data and I will wait for uh, an output. So if you have to uh, do some uh, data pro uh, processing or you have to build like a complex model, they expect um, someone uh, to do it. And in this case, I also see like uh, they are not so willing to um, hire like people to do it. But if you have a uh, machine that is able to do it for you, um, that's that may work. Um, so I think that we are moving there uh, pretty much because it's also like so so far it has been also about um, development of things, about researching, finding new models, like see what works better. Uh, but now it's like okay we need to put that in production, we need to deploy the models, we we need to use them like for real things, uh, not just um, for publishing that in a paper or whatever. So I think that we are moving there, and I think that NLP, you may know better about it, but this like what I see, like everybody is talking about it, it's like the new thing, so part has been like, oh, there are networks, there are networks, still, we are working on that, and there are a lot of people who are interested there, but uh, every time um, I talk about machine learning with someone, it's like about NLP, because um, word is, like news are very important, so I think that the way that news are spread at um, some point, I've seen like, oh, we have now um, tools that are able to be like uh, fake news, how do we take that? Uh, so I think that for what I've seen, and this is my personal opinion, I think that ultra and NLP are gonna be like big thing uh, in the next year probably. 
maybe not a prediction, but just kind of some areas that I think are really interesting to watch. Um, so I think we saw it sort of yesterday in the um, NVIDIA keynote. Uh, there's a lot of systems now that are finally starting to appear that make the end-to-end -end life cycle easier. Um, Azure Machine Learning is another one of these. There's MLflow. And so this is something making uh, like production-level machine learning accessible for a lot more people and making it easier for people to iterate. So I think it's going to be um, very interesting to see what happens over the next year is a lot more people are able to actually take machine learning and, and put it in production. Um, and then a research trend that I think is very interesting related to this is uh, kind of software engineering, testing, ops, and programming languages. But we're still very much in the early days of machine learning, and so as far as it is a, like a software discipline, and so I think it's going to be very interesting to see uh, now that more people are doing this and trying to, to put it in production and provide guarantees, uh, how we sort of mature our end-to-end -end software stacks around that. So I think those are kind of two like, uh, interesting areas to watch over the next year, and we're starting to see very interesting research papers, and uh, so that, those areas I think are going to be pretty cool in 2020. Okay. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so um, the next question is, um, what progress do you see the field making in terms of AI bias and ethics? And um, I guess, um, yeah. Okay, so I think um, both Sarah's talk yesterday and um, uh, Aaron's talk today uh, gave some nice overviews. Um, so I think these are areas that are um, starting to get even more and more attention. I think that's a, that's a wonderful thing. Um, something that um, I'm particularly uh, happy to see um, that Sarah mentioned yesterday is both the um, uh, model cards work as well as the data sheets for data sets work. So I think um, there's been research showing um, like, well, how can you um, like say what is in a data set and what sort of uh, tests have been applied to it and what's representative and what are, what are use cases that are sort of um, recommended and which are sort of by or who are. Um, and I think that's a really good direction. Um, another direction that um, I'm excited about is that I think, so in Aaron's talk, we talked a little bit about like sort of fairness and accuracy trade-offs. Um, but actually in, in both vision and language, there's a, um, there's a lot of situations where you actually don't have a trade-off, that the fairness issues are actually very related to robustness issues. And so if you make your systems more robust, they'll get both more fair and more accurate. Um, so like the example that Sarah showed yesterday where you know you had a, a wolf classifier and you were just looking at whether or not there was snow, um, in that example, if you actually had a better model of what a wolf is, then you'd be less biased towards producing huskies and you also would have a better classifier. And so um, one trend that we've been seeing is sort of creating data sets and task setups that are not the sort of traditional IID setting, where sort of you have different um, prior distributions in your training set as well as your evaluation sets, so that if you just lock, latch on to really surface statistics, you'll do much worse when you apply it. And so I think that's really exciting. Um, so I think one of the, the biggest things I sort of, where we're going over the, the next year is um, this is an area where I think research has really done a great job across multiple fields of highlighting issues, putting out potential um, mitigations or best practices, but we're kind of a long way from people sort of regularly doing this and being aware of it. And so I think one of the big things that's going to happen the, over the next um, year or two is really focusing on how do we scale this, right? How do we put um, best practices in place, uh, for example, company-wide? How do we train people that are building solutions with customers? And so a lot of work on um, process and tools to start making this technology and these ideas actually really usable by um, more than kind of researchers who are steeped in uh, the area. And then I think technologically, the area I'm the most excited about at the moment is uh, particularly privacy. I think we really haven't, uh, everybody we know it's an important topic, but we haven't really pushed very far on uh, you know, how much better can we do and um, 
you know, for example, TensorFlow Privacy came out this year, and I think that was a very interesting first step. And so, uh, looking at sort of this intersection of homomorphic encryption, enclaves, differential privacy, perhaps other technologies, uh, I think that's a, a research area that is really interesting, and I think that could really move us forward in um, in AI ethics. But there's also this really interesting. Um, relationship between these different things where if you're working in fairness you have a strong sort of desire to want to look at everything that you might want data you don't even have like looking at people's race so that you can make sure that this is working well across races and so if we start pushing towards more privacy or eyes off training or things like that we have a tension of like how do we balance making sure we protect against these other concerns but also sort of increase uh, privacy so I think that's uh, one of the kind of interesting Tensions we're going to have to deal with even more as we move forward. Does anybody else want to comment on? Okay, so um, I guess one comment that I'll make, and I've noticed, is um, I'm really happy to see the conversation discussions with including multiple stakeholders because I think that's really going to help um, with bias and all of that. You know, bringing in social scientists and people, and not sort of putting this burden um, just on you know the machine learning person. So I think that's going to be like. Incredibly helpful. Yeah. Um, so our next question is related to um, NLP. Um, um, there was actually a lot of great um, information in that state of AI report, um, but you know we we can discuss that here since um, we we've seen it. What have been the most impactful breakthroughs, and where do you uh, think that there still needs work? I'll take this one. So. Um I think that the progress in um, transfer learning and having pre-trained representations that are an awesome starting point for a wide variety of tasks has been really impactful over the past year. Um, the work I talked about uh, yesterday was work, and there were um, other examples like uh, GPT and Elmo and Nilumpin and ExcelNet, but I, I consider all of these sort of the, the same style of instead of having very, very custom models where you start from scratch in both architecture design and data and learning for every single task, you have these starting point um, for NLP where you can then um, take this starting point and have lots of sort of general purpose knowledge and then you can um, train very good models for your downstream tasks with much smaller amounts of data. Um, in terms of where I think there is more work, is so, um, these models learn on the basis of like what they've seen in text, which means that there's a lot of things that they might not see in text. Um, so one uh, interesting challenge that I saw, um, the data set that came out of, I think, I think uh, the Allen Institute, it was common sense question answering. So instead of the sort of factoid machine reading comprehension um, uh, style that's usually been popular, it's questions like, if you stand um, uh, under a waterfall with a, or, or sorry, like if you're by a river with a cup and you hold it up, where will water get in the cup? And then uh, you need to say like, okay, yes to waterfall and no to bridge and so on. And these are things that like are actually really easy for humans, but it's very unlikely you would just pick up if you just read a bunch of textbooks or um, Wikipedia and so on. And so um, models that are really accurate on sort of more challenging questions are actually um, pretty bad at these sorts of things. So I think what we need to see is more how do you integrate sort of this sort of common sense knowledge that might not be found in text, as well as how do you integrate information from different sources, like um, maybe some things are found in text, but some things are found in knowledge bases, some things are found in images, and right now we don't have a great way of putting all these things together. Yeah, so um, I'll just say that um, I think the fields where there's a lot of text, such as legal, um, they're going to be disrupted because of all the progress that's being made with all of these pre-trained models, um, as you said. Um, I, I just want to say that, you know, since you look at Google, like, I love that auto-complete. Like, it was a little, it was a little, you know, scary at first. I was like, oh, it's great. Like, now I love that my email sentences and they spell words correctly, you know. And the other day, I, um, 
I wrote an email, but I didn't have the subject, and then it auto-completed. It made a suggestion for a subject, which was really, really neat. Um, so it's cool when we see these, you know, things sort of impacting our daily life. Yeah, it's very cool. Um, so the next question is, um, let me touch a little bit about, but what are your thoughts on AutoML? So, um, you know, specifically, like, what do you think new practitioners practitioner should still study, even with the utility of AutoML? You know, we have all these tools that are going to make it easier and easier and lower the barrier for entry, but what are sort of these foundational concepts that you think people should still learn getting into the field? So I think that even if we have AutoML, um, someone has to build that. So first thing is that we cannot forget about, about uh, building new models, keep researching, keep improving the models. So I think that people that who are really passionate about uh, machine learning should still keep learning all they can, not just the basic, like everything. Even if you have these tools, it's true that, for example, I build a model and I try to improve it and improve it. And I, I have to say, I usually go to an, uh, some auto ML um, tool to see, compare my results, so it can give you some kind of um, benchmark and see how you are doing. But you need to know, um, you, you still need to know what machine learning you have. In my view, you still need an, an expert on that. If you are just yes, interested in using, like you are not passionate about machine learning, you just want to use it to get your results. I still think it's important to know about um, basic things as data uh, processing. Still, you're going to give some data to uh, your auto tool. It will do some computations for you, but uh, still, you need to know that there are some things that you can do about all these training, testing, validation that you cannot test your data and data that you have used for training. But you still need the basis, of course. and. For me, it's still important to know about models in general, um, at least the basic, how to interpret uh, a model. Um, but I think that's mostly something more personal, like as a mathematician, I would like to see what's behind everything. And if you get a result, you can just trust on that. Uh, I think that you will have to be um, kind of uh, doubt about it and try to see what's there. So. I still think that even auto ML is a good thing. Uh, it's something that is very really helpful, but still we need to keep uh, working in the models and the, how the data, the, like the data you have. Uh, I think that we don't need to forget about what we have done so far. That we just need to keep improving and pushing harder. Does anybody else have any thoughts on that? So I think. There's still a lot of challenges besides just uh, building the model, right? The model's only as good as the data, and so I think just a lot of still understanding of what it means to make data-driven applications. Um, I think an easy call out would be uh, also the feedback loops, understanding that if your model makes decisions that affect the data it gets, that over time this can you know, have significant uh, effects. And so I think you still have to have quite a lot of um, knowledge and data and statistics to, to do this, even if you just don't have to spend as much time actually training your model yourself. So I think I think we're pretty far off from it kind of just being push button and you don't need to know very much about data and, and data driven applications. Um, adding on to, to what Sarah was saying, which I totally agree about the importance of data too. I think there are certain use cases where you might have a nicely teed up problem, but oftentimes a lot of the challenge is figuring out what data to collect. Oftentimes there are costs to figuring out how you want to collect your data, what format, even just choosing what to log, even if it's within your own company. And so like being able to make smart trade-offs there and figuring out how to process that data is also an important part of the puzzle. I think one thing that's kind of interesting within companies too is figuring out as sort of versions of AutoML get more sophisticated, how do you distribute machine learning expertise throughout the company so that you can do a mix of taking advantage of existing tools, but then also being able to innovate on high impact areas? Is it having some teams of specialists that then consult with embedded teams? Because um, there's certain advantages to sort of owning the business line and underst really understanding what are the goals of the product so we can even decide what types of models we should be building. 
and how to set them up. So I think that's for me also an interesting trend is seeing how companies adapt to the fact that there are a lot of existing tools nowadays. Yeah, um, thanks for that. Um, as a statistician, I always like look at the sample size and the data collection, and where. What about the data that's not there? You know, how well is it really representing our population? Um, so I, I, I would say there's yeah, there's definitely a lot that still needs to work, despite all that now. Um, so the next question is, um, according to this State of AI report, 88% um, of 4,000 researchers who publish papers at NeurIPS, ICML, ICLO were all men. Um, so what are your thoughts on that? So Taiwan, Netherlands, and France were three countries that had better than the average, which is 12% of women represented. And then the three countries that were um, at, the, at the greatest imbalance were Sweden, Finland, and India. So you know, what are your thoughts on that? And what can we do to increase that percentage and the impact of that? Um. So I was actually reading, uh, I work in the UK and I was actually reading some uh, information about it. Uh, they were saying like in IoT, less than 16% of um, the people who work in uh, IoT are women, uh, not even 5% of the uh, board, like members of that board um, are women or CEOs, like less than 10%, which was kind of um, crazy when I read that. It's like, I don't see that, but yeah, it's true. And because when, like, yesterday we were uh, having lunch, and we were like, how many women uh, in this room? I think we were like three, four. Um, and the rest of the room, uh, like, they were all men. So for me, I think that is the most important thing here, and what should change uh, the way this is is education. I think that education is just key uh, to be able to show women that uh, they can do exactly the same as a man and like uh, science are for women too that um, there is a whole world for that for us and we don't need to be scared about going to a room um, with all women because it happened to me like I was in a room with all women and I was like they are not going to listen to me or so we don't need to be scared, and I think that's something that we need to change, uh, like in the root. And clearly, for, for me, root is education. So if we, like, I'm very passionate about education. Like, I would like to just go and show uh, how uh, what I believe, and uh, like, I've been able to work in these kind of projects, and it's also for women. And if more women can show uh, little girls, and uh, not just girls, I think it's like education for everybody, like for the boys for the girls, like this is for everybody and how passionate we are about what we do. I think that that's gonna change because so far like for example um, when I started college like I, I think that only two of my professors were women. So if we start to change that and see that um, everybody can do it, for me that's basically can help to uh, be better uh, in this sense, and of course, it's gonna take time, so it's an easy task, but I think that is where we should start education. So, I've, uh, I work at the intersection of machine learning and systems, so a lot of the machine learning uh, papers and, and work and research that I've worked on are like larger teams and, and larger scale, and one of the things um, that I think is really also important for especially managers and team leads and things to watch out for is the culture of the group. Um, in this area in particular, I think we have a lot of kind of the, the myth of talent and the myth of genius, as well as um, the fact that, you know, people are, well, this is a really hard problem and I want to work with the best people and I want to work with that person I really trust. And, uh, you know, it's, it's well shown that you naturally trust people that are much more like you. And so uh, I've definitely been involved in teams that have very, very strong, very homogenous cultures, and when sort of uh, new people with different backgrounds came in, they they didn't have the trust. They were kind of from the outside from, in the uh, from the beginning, and that's a very hard place to be. And so I think um, in this area in particular, we really have to also watch the the culture of our teams and make sure that we're enabling people to be to contribute and be part of the inner circle because 
seen a lot of actually great people come and then, uh, and this has been across companies and different parts of the industry, come and then not make it and, and leave basically immediately. And it certainly wasn't their qualifications, but their ability to actually even be part of the team because of the culture. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I mean, I think one thing that was very interesting that I liked that they did is they looked at the differential between different countries. Um, I kind of wish they'd gone a little deeper there in terms of, you know, some of it I think might have been a small sample, but also like, were there any things that were happening in specific countries that help with this? Because I think one thing that has been impressive to me, I think is similar to what Sarah was saying, just like the fact that these little changes can actually have pretty big impact. And I've definitely seen in certain companies, there are certain teams where there's just great diversity and like a lot of variety and other teams where it just happens to be all men and there's no like real difference between the kind of projects that they work on but I just think it's the kind of thing that once people start putting in effort into it it can be either this really positive feedback loop or in the case where there is a lot of homogeneity without like a pretty concerted effort to start like looking for other types of talent it can also become reinforcing in that sense. Uh, the next question is, um, so uh, Finland is training 1% of its population on the basics of AI. Um, they've offered a free course. Um, and so uh, imagine the goal is to increase AI literacy in the country. Um, and so, you know, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. Well, that's about education, what I was just saying before. Uh, I think that that would be great if we can have it everywhere. I remember when I was studying, I was just a child, and there were some of my uh, friends that they used to go as the, the maths uh, teacher. Well, why are we studying maths? Like, it's useless. Like, uh, I don't need it. I don't need to know how to uh, do this. Like, in my real life, I'm not going to use it. Um, I remember that she used to say that's to help you kind of build your brain how to think about problems like you will face problems in real life, not about maths, but you need to be able to sit down and say, okay, this is my problem, this is where I'm going. I think that much of it is all about it. Like, I think it has a lot of these things, like the whole process, since you have your data, um, okay, what I'm gonna do my data, what kind of data I'm gonna use, how I'm gonna work with it, now what's the best model of this kind of data, then I have my solution, how do I interpret that? So I think it also helps you to kind of feel your brain in some way. Uh, so I think it's uh, it's a very good thing, and it will also bring um, more passion about science for everybody. It will make it more accessible. And what I was saying, ed education in that sense is key, and you can uh, show that there is a world for everybody. I remember having a conversation like uh, with one of my friends. She she's a teacher with uh, just um, kids, I think, like ten years old. She was like, I'm thinking to teach some, not just machine learning, basically programming, uh, because I think that helps um, the, the kids to develop their some skills that are very important and. Um, like we are uh, really fans of Harry Potter, and she's like, I just see a wand that you can learn how to like um, code with a wand for kids. Like also, you're not gonna um, write it so proper proper code, but it's like like how to create loops or how to do several things. So I think that that makes everything more accessible to uh, to everybody. I mean, I think that would be great if we can have it everywhere. Yeah, I, I think those are great points. I think it's really interesting that there's going to be this big skills gap, so proactively trying to fill that to help people uh, be able to take on a lot of the AI-related jobs, I think that's great. I think it's a really interesting point about how that can also potentially help contribute to diversity by making it a more standard part of the curriculum. One thing I would add to you is that I think there's a real need for greater AI literacy among the public and among policymakers. So I also see this as really important to fill that gap because at the end of the day, you don't just want a community of scientists making decisions which have a technical component, but really a lot of these are making value judgments, thinking about those hard trade-offs between fairness and privacy that were mentioned earlier, for example. So I think that having that sort of base level of literacy in the population will also hopefully help them as a society just develop better policies around AI. <laughs> 
Did you want to say anything? Okay. All right. Um, yeah, I, I would say that you know I, I think it's a great initiative. Um, you know, I, I was like I remember graduating from college and thinking, okay, I don't know how to get a lease on an apartment, financial literacy, making my own doctor's appointments. Like I graduated from college and yet there's so much that I didn't learn about my life and managing it. So um, yeah, there's 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 it's gonna like you said it's gonna help and all you know understanding it. Um, the next question I have is, um, who are five women doing AI work that you would recommend to um, offer their expertise and thought leadership on AI? Um, so if I was going to answer this question, I mean a lot of the women in AI who I work with most closely are also at Uber, so I'll mention a few from Uber and a few outside. Um, Raquel Artisan uh, is the chief scientist for our self-driving cars unit, so super important technical challenges around computer vision, also interesting policy implications, so I found the work she's doing super interesting. I think there was recently actually a profile of her that was, that was very good as well. Um, and then also two of the female directors of data science, so one's Fran Bell who runs our machine learning platform efforts as well as more broadly product platform. So some really cool applications of both like how do we build good machine learning tools for the company and then how do we also apply it on some interesting areas like for instance customer support, how can we use machine learning to help leverage the ability of our existing agents to, to solve those problems. And then finally uh, Dawn Woodard who is uh, data scientists running our MAPS organization, so a lot of really interesting problems there, um, and she's also the executive sponsor of our women in data groups, so really strong on both the sort of technical side and business side. Um, just out of interest, some uh, researchers whose work I find super interesting, uh, Barbara Engelhart out of Princeton, uh, Tamara Broderick from MIT, and uh, Danielle Wynn um, from University of Washington, sort of a bunch of different areas, Asian statistics, uh, high dimensional data for biology, but those are some of the researchers whose, whose work I found super interesting. Does anybody else want to share? It doesn't have to be five, but whatever names come to your mind. Cool, um, I'll just add a few from the NLP perspective. Um, so I wanted to highlight two academics. Um, Regina Barzley from uh, MIT does um, super fascinating work in NLP, and she's also now branching out into um, medicine and how some of this work can carry over into bringing AI to improve medical research, and that's super interesting. And the other one is Yi Jin Choi at the University of Washington, and she's been doing a lot of work on sort of combining language plus so language and vision, language and grounding, and really kind of pushing the boundaries of what we consider NLP work. To be honest, I'm very bad with names. I like I can't remember names even if I register. Like, so I cannot <laughs> even remember. I'm sorry. So one of the really great things about working in AI ethics in particular is that I think there are just some extremely amazing women in this area. So uh, uh, both these are. Uh, with at Microsoft, but uh, Hannah Wallach and um, Jen Morgan Vaughn are doing amazing uh, work. Um, they were involved in the, the, like, the data sheets work that I was talking about, and uh, there were a lot of other interesting work, and also um, Kate Crawford and, and Mary Gray. And the reason I, I think that a lot of um, these women are doing very interesting work is uh, some of them have very deep, you know, technical machine learning backgrounds, but they've also um, have a lot of understanding of social science and work with social scientists, so they're doing really great uh, work across the boundaries, which I think is uh, sometimes more than twice as hard, and so I think it's really great to see the work that they're doing. And then there's actually amazing people at Google also in this space. <laughs> Um, and so, um, does, does anybody else have any comments to make before I open it up to the audience? Questions? No? Okay, so we'll take some questions from the audience. Um, you can ask, I'll, I'll, I'll repeat it. Um, uh, I would like to ask the, ask the panel about the problem of regulation. Uh, we, have the, uh, we have examples like uh, fakes or uh, this uh, accident with uh, autonomous vehicle where where a person was killed. Uh, what are the, what are the, what are your comments on, on the need of regulating AI? Are we close to uh, to this point where this will become an urgent issue? Uh, 
what, what, what is your what is Okay, so I'm just going to repeat the question for the sake of the recording. Um, the question was, um, what about the problems with regulation, with fakes, with the um, with the adverse side effects of autonomous vehicles? Um, where do you see, um, you know, where do you see that going? You know, addressing those problems. I'm holding the mic so I can uh, start here. So I think. Um, Regulation is an important part of the story, and we ideally have a system where we have these checks and balances where um, the public and advocacy groups and the government, you know, keep technology or keep companies in line and make sure that they are using technology in the right ways. And uh, but part of the story has to be this education piece, right? We need to make sure that we're regulating in the right ways that actually have the effects that we intend and not sort of other effects. Um, and I think the other important thing, so I think we do have a duty to help um, educate these communities and uh, make sure that, because we also were talking yesterday about how in some of the spaces the existing regulations aren't right for this technology and they're holding us back, but in other cases maybe there should be more regulation and so we you know, really need to rethink it, which means we need to have people on, um, with all different backgrounds who can get together and think about what does it really mean to regulate this space. And then I think the other thing is, I don't think we should just regulate AI, right? It's AI in a particular domain or for a particular application. So I think it's a much more productive conversation to say, you know, autonomous vehicles or, you know, some other, other particular technology lending, instead of just thinking about what does it mean to regulate AI in particular, and I think that that will sort of lead to much more productive conversations. Yeah, I want to echo Sarah's point that I think um, a lot of these things are kind of going to be specific to the domain, and what makes sense in one domain might be might be different for another. And so making sure the people making the regulation sort of understand the, the problems is really important. Um, to your question of fakes, I think that's something where we also um, need more technological work. So if you think of something like spam detection, that was a really hard problem 15 years ago, and now we're really good at it. And so I think for fakes, um, like that's something that probably we need more and better research so we can um, keep up and um, get better at detecting them. So I think a lot of these things have both a policy component, but also a technological component. What can we do from the technology side to help? Um, yeah, and, and just to comment on the autonomous vehicles, one of the, um, what was in the report was that the fraction mile is driven by, um, you know, self-driving self cars versus um, people driving cars. It's like so little because they actually haven't made the progress that they, um, that, you know, we would have quite expected to see. Um, so, um, you know, it, it, in a way it's a little bit reassuring, like, okay, they're still working on it because it's a really hard problem. Um, so, yeah. Adding to the fakes, I think the other thing we need to do is separate the, the conversation from these sort of adversarial cases. Like I think if we, for example, which I know no one's proposing, but if it was suddenly just like illegal to make a deep fake, I don't think we'd have any less of them right now. And so we also need to make sure that we recognize that um, regulations help people who are well-intentioned make sure that they are doing it in the best way and they know what the best way is, but it's not going to help in any of these cases where our concerns are more about an adversarial environment. And so making sure that we separate these in conversations, I think will allow us to have a much more productive conversation about what regulations we might need and which problems they really are solving and which problems they aren't solving. Um, next question. Um, thank you for sharing your presentation today. I really appreciate it. Um, I guess my question is maybe like a philosophical question for on to ethics. Um, as you're going through your work and having your different conversations and thinking about the way these models steer people down forces of decision making or behaviors and so on, and thinking of what what is the impact of society if we are kind of like steering people maybe intend to like or look alike, etc. Just wondering how you your thoughts. So I'll just repeat the question. Um, what are um, you know, using AI to st these models that are directing people to go in certain directions? What's the impact of that? Um, yeah, so if anybody. 
answer that? I can say I think it's a, it's a really good question and it's a really hard problem and some of it depends on how we use the technology. So uh, I have worked um, on contextual bandits and using those in practice uh, for, for example, personalized news. And in that case, we actually saw that the algorithm increased the diversity of articles that people were seeing and people could find what they, they wanted. Now, of course, then you have the problem of this. The other side of it is what if we have echo chambers and everybody only sees their bucket and there's no unified content. And so um, I think the harder problems are societally who's deciding and should it be you know, a uniform thing or a very diverse thing? Do we want to do something about echo chambers? I think we can kind of make the algorithms ultimately do whatever we think the right policy is, but I think there's just a hard question around now that we have many different types of like content delivery mechanisms or recommendations. Do we need to think about the effect of that on society and are there actual interventions we should be doing? Uh, next question. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard of uh, imposter syndrome or where you feel like you're a fraud or you're not as qualified as the people around you in a position like when you come in. And um, I don't know if you ever felt that way or if you think that's a, a common thing for women getting into the field where even if they are qualified, they may not feel it or may lack the confidence. Okay, so the question was on imposter syndrome and how people um, can feel that everybody around them is um, so much better than them, even if they are qualified, and how that um, impacts women in the field. I, well, personally, I felt like that sometimes. Like, um, everybody around you is better and they have like, um, more affinity and, for example, between men, and like if you are in a team with men, and you say like they share more things, uh, and then you start to wonder, uh, like maybe I'm not as good. Um, at the end, I've seen that in a few colleagues too. But uh, I think that between us, we support each other, and uh, we 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 need to do like some thinking, and I'd be able to help me, for example, like. Okay, yes, don't think about it. Um, focus on your work. Uh, you know that what you are doing your best. Like, you cannot uh, let that um, kind of mind you in. And, like, oh, um, I don't know, at the end, you don't work in the way you should. So, you, are, you just need to focus and say, okay, I'm doing my best. I'm not going to let nobody around me just say, um, you are not doing it. Uh, as, you, as far as you are happy with what uh, you are doing. Uh, you need to keep that. Um, yeah, I think it's uh, super common. <laughs> um, uh, I read one book that I found helpful. Um, it's called How Women Rise, and um, it's written by some executive coaches. One of which, one of whom had written, before written this book that was very popular, like called What Got You Here or Won't Get You There. Um, but yeah, that original study had focused mostly on male executives. And so there are a bunch of habits in the original book saying, you know, oh, don't like overclaim your accomplishments, uh, don't always take credit. And uh, some of these behaviors are sort of actually um, much less frequently done by women. And so then they went back and um, sort of added a sequel um, with habits that are, are done by both men and women, but are, are common in women. And so um, they had a number of tactical strategies that I think have actually made both work sort of um, easier and more fun. So like one example is um, that, that I certainly fell into is that the um, like failing to recruit allies early. So like if you don't reach out to potential other experts until you have something like completely ready to show them, then that actually causes a lot more work for you. It makes it harder to collaborate and like it's sort of less fun and more harmful for the work. Whereas if you sort of reach out early, then um, you can actually get more feedback, you can collaborate early, it's easier to bring people in and you both leads to better work and sort of like um, less 
less work to get to a better outcome. So there's a lot of tips like this I found really helpful. Yeah, I really love that example. Definitely guilty of that one. Um, I think for me in general, a lot of the imposter syndrome stuff, I think the phrase earlier, like the myth of genius, I think really applies here. Like, oftentimes I think it comes when we have these abstract ideas of like what a role is supposed to look like or like what the qualities are that are necessary. So I think there's like a great role here for like managers and organizations in terms of when you boil things down to really concrete competencies and action items, I think that just makes things a lot easier. So other than being like, oh, I'm not qualified enough, rather than that, having a set of like, oh, here, you know, soliciting a lot of feedback and having like concrete feedback to act upon. So things like, oh, I need to loop in, I need to work on my stakeholder management specifically, I need to loop people in earlier in order to get their feedback. And if you have like just a list of concrete things that you want to continue to improve on, it just, so I think it's a lot less scary than this overall feeling of not being good enough. So I think reframing it from an abstract, I'm not good enough to like, here are the three or four concrete things that I want to improve on, at least for me, makes it a lot less scary. So I think this is a, a useful mechanism, but um, also for diversity and, and teams in general. But um, I switched research areas a couple of different times and had a variety of different uh, roles in my career trajectory. And so quite often I was sitting at a table where it's it very easy to say, like, I'm just not qualified at all. I don't know anything about this area. I don't know. And um, it's always been really helpful for me to think about, like, do the mental exercise and have a deep grounding on like what my strengths are and what they're not and like why I'm sitting at the table and what I brought to the table. And the nice thing about this is when it gives you that sort of confidence and conviction, but it also allows you to uh, like know the things I'm not and be able to then hire people who can play that part or collaborate with people that can play that part. And so um, this idea that kind of everyone is is good in the same way and there is you know just one way to do machine learning research or one way to, to be a software engineer or any of this just isn't true and so if you start breaking it down to these are my strengths this is this person's strength then it starts looking a lot less scary like oh I, i'm you know the imposter here because everyone is going to be different and have different strengths um, so it, and at least i will say personally it took me a while to sort of concretely know what they are and have confidence in them, but I think it's a good thing um, that I definitely recommend people try to think sort of deeply about it, and it will help you also, you know, picking roles and things in your career. So but what I remember that I, I was in, in a conference too with the, uh, women, and one um, friend just uh, said, okay, so you know what I do, uh, and I try to do it too daily, um, she was like, if you read an email from a man, uh, like, you don't see things like I think be cool. Like you just see things like I'm gonna do this, 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 and this. Like they don't uh, hesitate about anything. So she was like, every time I read an email, uh, I just uh, or write an email. Sorry, uh, I just write my email and then I go back again and I remove everything, every cool, everything that is not certain, like I remove that and I change completely that. And I've been trying to do that lately. I think it helped, uh, like I think it can help. So. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to add my one thought on it is I feel imposter syndrome all the time and one thing I say to myself, okay, but still keep doing work, like don't stop, like don't get stuck in that state where I'm not actually getting anything done because I'm feeling, you know, like I can't do it, so that's, that's one thing. Um, any other questions? I just want to quickly add some salt to that. Um, you will be punished for eventually. Um, so. So I'll just repeat that for the sake of the recording. Um, the statement was, um, you may be punished for um, not putting in the appropriate amount of hedging for your gender. That's what it was. Uh, any other questions? Yes. Yeah, so my question kind of naturally segues from your question. Uh, so some of you expressed that there have been situations before where you walk into a room and you're kind of the only woman there. 
right? And some of you also expressed that in situations like these, uh, there there is a sort of a fear to express your ideas in the in the fear that they might be looked down upon. Uh, so um, uh, my question is whether uh, how often this type of a tendency occurs, and uh, what I'm wondering is whether this tendency is kind of uh, making the men feel more, uh, I mean, is this a vicious cycle? That's what I'm trying to know. If like more and more women, women are uh, holding back their new ideas, and that's, that's the reason why more and more men in the world space are thinking less of the women and men. It just goes on and on. Is, is this the case? Okay, so I'll just um, sort of phrase that question. The question was, how often do you walk into a room or a situation where you're the only woman or one of very few women, and being in that position, sort of, um, you're less inclined to share, participate, you know, and um, if that sort of situation reinforces itself where the men dominate the conversation, um, so I, I hope I rephrased that. <laughs> okay. Um, so, yeah. Well, I find that situation very open, uh, I think. But I think that we are doing some improvements. Like, it was more complicated before to go and like, say what you uh, think. But I think that, yes, knowing that you have the support of all these women, and we want to be listened to. Uh, like, I think that, it's, yeah, it kind of could be a like a vicious thing, but I think that we are going in the right direction. Like every, every time I see more women, yeah, saying I'm not gonna keep quiet, I'm just gonna say what I think. So hopefully, uh, we are going uh, in the right direction. One thing I've uh, done as a manager that I think has helped both women and men is. Um, try to not just spring topics on people cold in a meeting, but um, either have like pre-work, so they're asked to think about something beforehand, or mention it in something one-on-one, -on -one, so the people who, these might be men or women, who are shyer or might prefer to sort of gather their thoughts before speaking up, have the opportunity to gather their thoughts ahead of time, and then that usually makes people much more likely to share. Or even asking people to, you know, come prepared with a slide um, expressing their things, and then they present it, and they've had the benefit of that prep time. And I think that helps a lot of people. One of our leaders at Microsoft was um, speaking and mentioning that he had adopted a. a practice that's commonly used at another company where for similarly to producing a slide where for all the meetings you start with a written document and everyone reads it at the beginning and um, he actually said the reason he started doing it, the reason he stuck with it is it enabled a lot more people to speak and present their opinions when it was written and it took away this notion of like well, I'm comfortable speaking in front of a group or a group of people that are more senior than me, but maybe the person next to me is not. And so um, I think a lot of what we can think about in terms of me communication mechanisms that enable more people to contribute is an important thing. And um, I probably, hopefully, lots of people have experienced this as well. But if a meeting leader even has a strong um, meeting culture where they specifically ask people who haven't spoken up, you'll find that even once that person is gone, everybody else adheres to that culture and they say, oh, so-and-so hasn't spoken, would you like to speak? We haven't heard from people with this background. Um, so I do think there's a lot we can do in terms of changing the mechanisms um, to enable more people to contribute. And I think it's also important to highlight that this uh, certainly affects women, but it also affects uh, men and people who just come from different backgrounds or have less confidence, and so I think it's it's great if we think about this as a problem of just enabling everybody to contribute at the level they'd like to, and, and not about even just a gender-specific problem. Anybody else want to comment? Just echoing, I think those types of practices are super valuable, and I also would just add to emphasize that 
it's not just that like, oh, this is nice because then we'll be hearing more people's point of views. I do think it genuinely leads to better decisions because I think the correlation between being willing to speak up and take a meeting time and like having the best idea, you know, maybe there's some, but just by soliciting all the viewpoints, I think oftentimes the leader too just may not be aware of all the different viewpoints in the room. So just getting.